Welcome to My Community, where we journey deep into the heart of neighborhoods that breathe life into our beautiful island, Barbados. Today we present a special exploration of Sweet Bottom or Sweet Vale here in St. George, a community steeped in charm, history, and the warmth of its residents. From its winding roadway to the laughter-filled corners of its local gathering spots, Sweet Bottom or Sweet Vale embodies the essence of community spirit. Welcome to My Community. I'm Sherwood McCaskey. As always, thanks for joining us. In this special episode, we reveal the stories, the traditions, and the vibrant culture that make this corner of St. George truly unique. What is the real beginning of this community, Mr. Brown? The real beginning is the village itself and its name and its history. There's a sign at the top of the gap up the road that tells of Mr. Francis Butcher, who lived at Golden Ridge, given five four-acre lots of land to his concubine. At his death, he bequeathed that she would have five lots of land in a place called Sweet Bottom. And her name was Fibber. I researched this when we were doing the crop over time some years ago. The sign is there, 1777, the first non-white village in this country. And that makes Sweet Bottom it gives a unique place in the historical geography of this country. Often not known, and we don't advertise it as much as we should. But that is the first thing I would see bottom. Secondly, as a child, I used to wonder why it rained so much in Sweet Bottom. And then I learned that it's an aquifer. And that is an area that collects water and stores water. The water collects on the ground. There were times if you dug too deeply in Sweet Bottom, the surface water would come, come up. That's why they have, they have several wells dug down the road there, and that's why Golden Ridge is a reservoir. And there are several wells dug in Sweet Bottom, starting from Tappy Pond, right down to Fisher Pond. Four sets of wells that fuel the water up to Golden Ridge, which then goes across to Castle Grant and sends water to the east. It's between two ridges, really. You have Golden Ridge that runs to the south of the, of, the, of the community that runs a ridge, goes all the way up to Ashbury, into St. John. On the other side of the St. Joseph, there's Paris Hill, there's Indian Pond, and there's Andrews Long Hill. So it's a valley between two ridges that collects rainfall. As a kid, I thought the rain fall every night. I've witnessed climate change in Sweet Bottom. When we were small, there was something called Redmond Pond. Was filled, that was Joe's grand, grandfather, Redmond Pond was filled with water most of the year. There was also a rudder pond up the road that was also filled with water. And then there was Andrew's Swamp, where we went to catch little fish as little boys, that was filled with water. Over time, it reduced rainfall. All of those inland drainage systems had disappeared. As the rainfall, I think, for the island declined, I'm not a, a hydrologist, all that kind of stuff, but I did kind of observed that rainfall decreased over time and it was evident by the inland drainage systems of the community. And then we are on a limestone foundation and that limestone allows water to go through it and to collect water as well. I'm a kind of a bit of a, geography of, of, a geographer of some kind, yeah. So yes, the geology of the place and its location. And yet it's elevated so one feels at night a drop in temperature. Because we are still a few hundred feet above sea level, despite being in the sweet bottom, it was an elevated bottom. So most mornings you could feel a bit of a drop in temperature and you could see the mists as you look towards the east, towards St. John in the early mornings. So sweet bottom's history, its geography, its geology are things that make it a unique place. Hence the name sweet, I suspect. Sweet bottom is a, is a very unique place. Um, I think it's got its name from the sweet part is from the soil. Almost anything you plant here 
wood grow. Yeah. It's very soil, it's very fertile. That the sweet part at the bottom is because we are surrounded by little ridges, as Mr. Brown said before. Hence the name Sweet Bottom. I came to Sweet Bottom, I was about 10 years old, and found a village, a vibrant village, next to a factory. Livy has that story to tell, Andrew's factory, and its role in the village. And another factory in St. John, Courtney's father would have been a pan boiler. Yeah, a pan boiler, or say a sugar boiler, pan boiler, you know. He learned the trade from my grandfather because my grandfather went to Guyana. Because Guyana had exclusive rights, as it were, and they, they guarded very jealously. They never really taught other people, but somehow he came back here and he was able to, 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 to teach my, my father. Um, there was a guy called Mr. Green, um, Lashley, really Lashley, he was at Lower State. My father, uh, my grandfather was an upland factory, um, no clothes. Um, they, 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 they tested the sugar, the, the quality of the sugar, to see if it was right. You know, they use a glass and they, they put it in the glass and, you know, and look at the glass to see if it was well done or cured enough to be, to, to be put on the market. Um, so, and it was, it was really well paid at the time, you know, it was well, well paid, a well paid job. The sugar industry dominated Sweet Bottom in those early 1950s. We used to go into the cane field, in the middle of a cane field, and sit down there for a, a, about a half day sucking cane most of the day, you know, uh, when, when Bama used to run us, you know, and that, 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 that type of thing. That field was called Betsy Paris and it contained what was called frozen joy. Thick, yellow canes that produced lots of sugar. I guess they would say low sucrose content. And if you didn't watch them, you would go there and you'd sit and have our bellies full and get our jaws tired. But Sweet Bottom is surrounded by about five plantations. Fisher Pond in St. Thomas, Andrews in St. Joseph, Redland in St. John, Cottage that fed sugar to Andrew's Sugar Factory. Andrew's Sugar Factory was a major part of this community. At least 20 or so men worked there. I refer to Mr. Robert Critchlow, who was a manager. Livy Allen worked there for most of his life. The Garns brothers, Frank and Freddie. Mr. Innes across the road worked there. Mr. Holder. Um, so any day you could see men answering the call of the factory on their bicycles going up to Andrew's factory the horn of the factory, the ashes, the noise, and the trucks going to the factory. So Andrew's factory was a part of it. Over time, um, it seemed as if it didn't seem to do the job. It was supposed to have been refurbished, renewed to be part of an energy project that was abandoned. So there now there's a derelict factory over there. I remember too that the, at the end of the crop season nearly, men went to the, to the garrison because the plantation owners raised horses. So there were horses at Castle Grant and Redland. And the first jockey we had was Winston Walton. My first day at the races was on a truck, Redland truck, going to see Winston ride Mr. Prince Walker's horse from Prairie Island. So the, between the men, there were the men in the village who cut canes. St. Clair, Thorne, Aaron Bess. Duncan Holder, Alan Patrick, um, Mr. Lynch, um, Bubu Catlin, Sonny. about 20 men who worked in the fields. These are the men who grew up watching in the village, going to work with a sharpened bill, five in the morning, and bringing water from the pipe, and they're going to work. And as the, as the year changed from the crop time to hard time, those same men would go off to dig cane holes to cut grass. I, I was sort of upset at 15 to learn you could dig a hundred cane holes in half a day and get three shillings. That men, expert cane hole diggers, got only three dollars. There's a man called a linesman who went and made up the lines that the cane holes had to follow. And so these skillful men dug holes um, square, about two feet square, two feet down, in which the canes were planted and the forks. Tremendous amount of labor. The women of the fields who loaded the canes, I remember them. And then there were those who were 
who would weed farms. When the crops were planted, they had a long hoe, and they went through the weeds. There was no spray, no grass in those days. A woman was out weeding the farm. So I remember too the, the sugar industry in Sweetwater. And I guess the sweetness came also from that part of the activities here. So yeah, the, the, the sugar industry too, as a child growing up, to see it change from what it was then. At first, the, the, the cane was carried by animal drawn carts later on. Later on, we saw men digging cane holes. And then years after, we saw caterpillars furrowing the fields to plant the canes. So I've seen the sugar industry evolve over my 40 years in Sweetwater. This series started on the final Sunday in December of 2019. And ever since that first episode, we've come to recognize the common threads weaving throughout nearly every Barbadian community. Once again, I urge our students of history to revisit these episodes all readily available on YouTube and to synthesize these recurring themes into a cohesive publication, thereby contributing to knowledge generation, that wonderful connected knowledge which is so needed in Barbados today. And now on to the heart of the matter, people. A place devoid of its inhabitants is but a landscape. But with human habitation and interaction, it transform into a community. Indeed, it's the people who breathe life into Sweet Bottom or Sweet Vale. Let's come together to celebrate the vibrant souls that define this remarkable community. There were prominent people. The first house at the eastern end was the Nichols family. The Nichols family were scholars. There's Courtney Nichols and there was Neville Nichols. They were one scholarship, Sir Harrison College and they were extremely bright people. What I noticed about our forefathers in, in Sweet Bottom, they put education pretty high, you know. Um, they ensured that we got a, an education. And then there were several educators, Edna Nichols, Henry Brathwaite, Arthur Byer. I'm in not that category. My, my, I, mine would come at a later generation, but the, the young, the, all the guys were the ones whose names um, still live on. And there were the people who built the village. Uh, Boise Grant, um, St. Clair Grant was an educator. And Mr. Hal Braffitt lived right there, principal of one or two schools. And those were the scholars and educators of the village. And then there was a St. John family. The ophthalmologist Henry St. John lived down the road there. They went to Lodge. And then, of course, they can't leave out the university on the Robert Street in Morton High School, where you had Desmond. He attended the Morton High School. And, and I, I admire him, as, a, as it were, uh, when he, you know, raised it to the, to the, the, to the um, headmastership of a large school, you know. So these are guys that we look up to. We had Frida Nichols, she was at Queen's College. My sisters attended community college and also uh, the Morton High School. So they were concerned about education in, in this, which played a, a, a pivotal role in going forward, as, as, as it were. And I have to admit that the other prominent people were in the sugar industry. The palm oilers, like Courtney's father. Mr. Critchlow, who lived there, was a, a black under manager. We produced some very good uh, people here, and, and, and educationally and otherwise, socially. And um, we had like three policemen up here, uh, Desmond's two brothers, Toby and Charles, Charles Barden. He also was a policeman. Uh, we, we produce you know, athletes, uh, Freda Nichols, you know. Incidentally, her mother was my godmother, you know. Um, so Sweet Bottom um, produce a mixture of people socially, educationally, and otherwise. Uh, I remember the days you would see the, the priests walk in the village, you know, you know in his long gong. And sometimes you, you, you don't even want to confront him. You walk on the other side of the road, you know. Even the policemen, we, were, we, we had that fear, as it were. But that fear is not there anymore. Behold the evidence of changing times. Now, speaking of changing times, once upon a time, village shops stood as prominent landmarks and gathering places, serving as the beating heart of community life on our island. 
The community revolved around those cherished establishments, which not only provided essentials, but also served as hubs for social interaction and connections. This thread of tradition was woven into the fabric of Sweet Bottom, Sweet Vale, just as it was in countless other communities all across our island. I found in a small village five different shops in Sweet Bottom. Amazingly, five shops. There was Ms. Holder Rum Shop up the road. There was a Harding Shop, the Lawrence Shop, Sam Holder Shop and Bakery, and later on Mr. Burnett had a shop. That talks about the vibrancy of the village. I remember uh, we had a shop and a little sh short guy at the time, what they, there were some people called the Baileys, you know, and they had some protruding um, flesh in the back, you know, <laughs> and I would just go and slap um, this lady and <laughs> Esther, I think she was Esther, I ran aside, I got, I got a lot of lashes for that. But in my era, um, I saw a bit of, I don't think it was Mr. Salmon's father at that time, I think his sister, they used to call it uh, Sally's, Sally's and Swingers, so they took over from their father, right. Then there was the, there was a Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Gibson, a little further up the road. Also, um, the Shamrock, right, those are the ones that I came along and found. And was still, yeah, there was a Shamrock here. Shamrock. Then it became a Sweetville Grocery after. I wish we can revisit some of the things that we used to do then. Um, they had competitions that would, would come here, um, play um, something called this. They would come from various places across in George and, you know, converge at our shop and have this competition. Uh, we had people like Pappy Garns and, you know, Conrad Innes and my father and Mr. Brung, Desmond's father. They, we, we, would, we were very um, good in uh, Aaron, Aaron Bess. Teddy Motley, you know, they would play these games, um, this whist game. But as a child, what I enjoyed most was the, the greenery, the fruit trees, I don't know how many times Courtney want to admit that he stole coconuts or mangoes. I remember one time I went up in um, Eddie, mango tree, Connie's mother. And she, she, was, she would not move. She was there, staying there till they come down. I don't know what she was going to do. <laughs> but she remained there and never moved. So I said, oh my goodness, I got to get out of this area now. I got to get out of this tree. So I jumped, I jumped out the tree at her so that she would fall back and I would, then I would get away, <laughs> you know. We picked Aki's from somebody's tree without knowledge, how Mr. Gibson would look to see how many mangoes dropped and before they dropped, we took them and ran. But see, one of us also a place with green, green vegetation, lots of fruit. Every type of fruit could be found in Sweet Bottom. Later on, we learned that roast bread fruit was the way to keep a snack going by the pipe under the, under the mango tree. And well, I let Courtney talk about the cricket because he was the star of the cricket in the village. We played cricket in a place called the Swamp. Incidentally, that's where we used to, that was the, the Sea of St. George because you know, we don't have a Sea of St. George. That used to be the Sea of St. George. We used to go into the swamp to fish, especially on Saturdays. Uh, we used to go out there and bathe in the, in the swamp, you know, among the, the, the frogs and the tadpoles and that type of thing. Uh, I would get lashes. I remember, I also remember distinctly, I get a real beating for going out there. And like Mr. Salmon as well, we got some licks. Because I, like, I raised my grandmother, she always said, like, boy, you don't go in the swamp. But obviously, you know, you're a little hard here, you're a boy, so you can try things. So if you go in the swamp, fish, I need to have the fish like tilapia and the smaller one called thousands. So although they tell you not to go, you will still go and fish and bring home the fish. So you bring home the evidence that you went to the swamp. <laughs> so you get some licks of that, but it was all, it's always good fun. And that's why we, we played cricket as well. It made me remember that we used to play test matches before then, up the road versus down the road. And Courtney was captain of down the road, and I or somebody was captain up the road. And that was a, a big thing, that all these people in the village came out. And we played, we played with balls made of young green grapefruit and also the breadfruits, you know. 
<laughs> to play cricket. And then a guy in the ensemble learned to knit balls. And, and you knit, knit, knit a ball a combination of materials of fabric and stones and a bit of leather. There was no bats of to, like we had. We, we had to play with improvised bats from the, the bark of a coconut tree. You know, we used to use to play, um, play cricket with. We started playing cricket um, in some conditions that you know, you, one cannot imagine playing cricket there and learning your cricket there, what we call the hill, uh, Sydney. Um, and, um, when I started, I, I started as a batsman. I, I remember making 114 at Sydney. And when you, it was, it, it was on a slope. I talk about the conditions, it was on a slope. And the wicket was in, in the, in almost at the bottom of the slope. And when you hit the ball up the hill, it will roll back down, <laughs> you know, to the, to the, right, right on, the, on the field, uh, on the wicket. And Courtney was king. He was quick, younger than I, stronger, built faster. Then I saw Courtney develop into a BCL player with records that still stand, they tell me. The fastest 100 somewhere in St. John against a team. And also a 50, an 80 at St. Augustine. Most of the guys in Sweet Bottom in the early days went to St. Augustine to watch cricket and what we call the four-hip house. Courtney played there, so did I. But we formed our own club here in Sweet Bottom early in the early 1960s. It was called Sydney. We sadly, we know it's declined and, and um, it's almost gone. But those games were the games, there might have been about two dozen boys under 15 in Sweet Bottom in the 1950s. It was, and, and the young guys, um, 15, I, I think of Winston Walton, who was a jockey, eventually was one of the cricketers. Erling Yarns played cricket. But we had some very good players then, uh, like Samba, um, Desmond alluded to, uh, Exes, um, Gil, Robert, um, he used to be a good batsman. Desmond used to be a good batsman as well. I was always amazed when Courtney played for Barbados Colts against the Australians with Ian Redpath. And that was like the young cricketers, I think it was 21 then. The, the young cricketers, you know, who couldn't make the Barbados team because we had a real players, good players. And, and what was, um, I remembered about that is that Sir Everton Weeks, he came out of retirement and captained the, the Colts team. And not only did he captain, he made 119 not out. All these things need to be known to, to, to our young people, you know. Football, no. Only if, you, only if somebody killed a pig, we blew out the bladder and kicked it around for a while. But that, the football didn't last very long because the, the bladders would burst. There was, no, no, there was no football around. Now, consider this. It is the first instance of community members sharing such insights in this series, Mind Community. The use of the bladder of the pig as a football. Perhaps further episodes will unveil whether this practice was common in other Barbadian communities. We played road tennis with our hands. And again, if, if you cut the ball, that was a big problem. But then the other thing was pitching marbles. That was the arena. There's a game called Killer. That was a terrible game of marbles and three holes. And that was a game of the road. But I think in that time, cricket was there. Um, I remember in 1961, um, I always say Courtney's father was a gentleman, maybe the only one of the village. We would sit under the window on the steps of the house, the private radio, the only one that was available to us, poor kids, to watch the 19, to hear it from Australia, West Hall Bowling. I don't know if that was captured his imagination, but it captured mine then. But it was at his father's house that we would listen to. The rest of the night at Australia, 1961. It was a wonderful experience, a little, a little boy. Teenagers are allowed to sit outside and to rest. Much like the village shop, the church held significant sway in community life. Like beacons, they occupied a sacred spaces in the collective consciousness of the community and were revered by its members. The Penuel Moravian Church, one of the oldest churches in the country, is at Sweet Bottom, an old Moravian Church. Where you had Mr. Pilgrim, Reverend Pilgrim, uh, he was an educator because he had the, the school in St. John as well, which I attended, and, and uh, Mount Tabor, that's right. Yeah, Mount Tabor. Um, not only that, that then that, that, that same church was used as a, as a school, private school, 
on, on Mr. Haywood. I think he attended Harrison College. He was the, the principal, the headmaster of that school. Right next door to us, uh, to our home, there was a church called the Church of God. Mr. Thornhill was the, the pastor there. Uh, and then uh, Nicey, what, what, what we call, um, she, she, she was the chief cook and ball washer there, as it, as it were. She, 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 she Miss Brooks, um, Sister Brooks. Um, she was a thorn then. Um, she, she was very helpful. And then they went on. They, 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 the church. I don't think they ever paid us, not because they didn't want to. I think my father allowed them to just stay on the land free. He never charged them. Then they moved to a, a, a different location. And then, of course, everybody remembers the revival nights at the New Testament Church of God. That brought a different kind of spirit to the village. So there was, there were spiritual things as well in the village that we could enjoy, not only for entertainment, but I think it kept us as better young men as we grew up. And that's my first impression of Sweet Bottom, um, briefly. People, a lot of people don't know about this, but my father had a, a, a choir, a group choir. Yeah, he had a choir. They would go and, and, and sing at service in songs. Yeah. And he had a truck. Um, you asked Des Desmond about the, uh, the transportation, but he had a tr truck because you know the, the, what they used to do is to put this thing on top of the truck. The, the truck would be used for hauling canes, you know, hauling stones or whatever. And then when 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 needed, they would put it, uh, this thing up top, this this tray up top the tray with seats and that type of thing with canvas at the side, and they, and. He used that, you know, even to go to cricket on Saturdays to take people to take people to the beach, you know. So he was really a man before his time, you know. Um, he did a, you know, quite a bit in this community. These gentlemen, along with several others whose roots are in this community, have not only served this area admirably, but have also made a significant contribution to the wider Barbados and beyond. We can proudly name several of them. In fact, many are mentioned in this episode. Their names are today emblazoned throughout the island and are now synonymous with excellence, not only here, but in the region and in the wider world. Through their outstanding effort, they have impacted countless lives positively and have written their names, or rather the name of Barbados, on history's page. It is perhaps time for a form of monument or memorial celebrating the people of Sweetbottom, Sweetvale. I just want to remember as well, when the, there was a playing field here that was open, uh, we had um, the representative that then, Glenn Clark, he came up, um, Dr. Esther, um, so cool, she was here, and I was told that it was discussed in the House Assembly that they should name this playing field after me, right? It never came to fruition. I hope someday it would happen, and not only me, but I would like to see the, the, a joint between my seven Desmond, you know, Desmond Selman playing field, you know, because um, Desmond made a great contribution and he was a great role model to, to, the, to the community. So hopefully, sometime before I go to the far beyond, they can perhaps you know consider naming the playing field um, for my cricket exploits that I, I contributed to to the community and whatever else I did in the community. As always, thank you very much for staying with us. This has been a presentation of my community, Sweet Bottom, Sweetville. I'm Sherwood McCaskey. The series continues next week at the same time.